All right, students, so here we are, part three of chapter three. We're going to talk mostly about ports. And of course, what a port does is allow us to connect a peripheral device to a computing device. So uh, example at the beginning, we had a thing called a parallel port, big purple connector at the end, um, and we would connect a printer to it. So we could connect a printer to a desktop or, or even to a laptop back in the day. The biggest thing with, with ports is, of course, like all of the computing technology, ports have gotten better. They've gotten faster. They communicate faster. They've gotten smaller, more efficient. We're going to look at all of that. So, But basically, just know that a port allows us to connect a peripheral device. That cable that you're used to charging your smartphone with, by the way, can also, of course, be attached to your laptop and transfer a bunch of data between your phone and your laptop, uh, even install a new operating system, for example, on your smartphone if you wanted to hack your smartphone. So we'll look at some of the more common ports today, understanding that at each, you know, a port takes a connector, the connector, you know, joins a cable to a port, a connector at one end of a cable attaches to a port on the computer or mobile device and a connector at the other end attaches the port on the peripheral device. So also keep in mind that in these ports, we can use what's called a dongle. So for example, I have a connector that on one end is a USB port. On the other end is an Ethernet port because my laptop no longer has a default Ethernet port. So we would use one of those. And we see those a lot in Macs as well where they have common ports on the computer that can do many things. So not as specific as, say, the USB. We'll take a look at these. So we've really gone away from the old analog ports, the VGA analog port. We're now into digital. Um, the parallel port was analog. Here, what we're talking about, uh, a display port is one way of connecting a monitor we see these a lot on HPs. HPs use display ports, whereas like Dell computers, they're going to use the HDMI. HDMI, of course, handles audio and video. And then we went from the VGA to a DVI, digital video interface, for connecting monitors that were digital when we got into the LCD monitors. So headphone jacks, you know, the little eighth inch headphone jack, lightning port, we see these on you know, iPhones, um, iPods, those kind of things, tablets, Mac, highly used by Mac. Another microphone port here. So whether we're connecting for audio out or in this case, microphone port audio in using that same eighth inch. Micro USB, pretty common we see these. Display port. So I have one of these on my uh, laptop. So it's another means of connecting a display. So in this case, I have a cable that goes from a display port out to a DVI, uh, for example. And then we get into USB. And USB, so what we're talking about here are multi-use cabling and multi-use ports that basically have increased in speed. Now, I'll give you an example of this. So mini USB, mini HDMI. Uh, so again, a lot of smartphones, we can hook the smartphone up to our large screen TV and broadcast a movie over that. Ethernet cable, so it looks like a phone cable, but it has eight wires in it. Okay, it's this portion of an Ethernet cable is called an RJ45 connector, RJ45, whereas on the phones that you might be used to, RJ11. So RJ45, and now Ethernet cables, we can do power over Ethernet, which means it can be used to transfer data and to supply power to the peripheral device that we're connecting to. There's that speaker, Thunderbolt. We're gonna talk about speeds of these in a moment. USB type A, USB type B. We don't see type B as much anymore. Okay, we used to see like, uh, you know, output there, input into like scanners, printers, etc. type B. Just don't tend to see that as much anymore. So a USB port, hopefully you're familiar with the universal serial bus, short for universal zero bus port, can connect up to 127 peripheral devices together with a single connector. 127. Now, 
I've never had to do this, never wanted to, but I could certainly get a USB hub, I have a 3.0 hub, that gives me 10 USB slots. Well, I can use that by connecting it into one USB slot into my laptop and connecting 10 peripheral devices into that hub so that all of them can work together. Okay, so directly into ports or mobile computers, some mobile users use those docking stations or hubs, for example, okay? So an example here, a little docking station, you know, for a tablet, wireless keyboard, most likely Bluetooth. We'll talk about Bluetooth in a minute. It's a wireless communication. So we don't have to have these ports, okay? USB ports here, example. Bluetooth, again, you're probably familiar with it. Um, I don't need to hook a physical connector into my phone to have a speaker in my ear and a microphone. I can have a Bluetooth wireless connector. Um, Wi-Fi, we've talked about, and NFC, near field communication. So, so ports, uh, let me just quickly pause and bring up a website here. I want to introduce you to speeds of ports. Hold on. All right, so I'm going to give you a link to this uh, website here, online-techtips.com. Here's a quick summary. This is sort of the latest and greatest. What I want to talk about, though, is USB ports. So USB started out as a 1.0 technology. We really didn't see its use uh, common until we got the 1.1. And USB 1.1 could handle speeds of 1.5 megabits per second to 12 megabits per second. So we're talking speed here. Okay, how much data can be transferred in that second? Megabits. 1.5 was used for like joysticks and connectors, controllers, whereas the 12 megabits was designed for peripheral devices that we would communicate a lot of data over. For example, uh, a portable disk drive or an external disk drive, for example, external storage. Um, then we got into USB 2.0, which we see here. I really don't like this order, but USB 2.0 would transfer at a whopping 480 megabits per second, 480. But then we went up to 3.0, and USB 3.0, which is right here, would transfer at uh, 5 gigabits per second. Now we're up at USB 3.0, also called Type A USB, 10 gigabits per second. Now that's a true rate of a transfer either reading or writing at 10 gigabits per second, okay? However, uh, as we know, you know, up came Apple. Apple came up with the Firewire, and notice way back in the day, 95, they were transferring 196 megabits per second across Firewire 1, and then the second version, the Firewire 400, 390 Back in 1995, that's just amazing at the speeds that they were getting over, say, you know, um, USB. Firewire came out first, so they were getting these speeds before the next version of USB, just so you're familiar with it. So there's some that we don't need to go into. Fiber channel, you know, 2 gigabits per second. We now have 10 gigabits per second over fiber channel. So these would be special network interface cards that we could put in one server, connect to a storage device so that they could transfer a lot of data amongst many servers. Today, as we know, you know, you, uh, Thunderbolt back in the day, Thunderbolt started to exceed, uh, you know, two times 10 gigabits, then Thunderbolt 2, 20 gigabits per second uh, transfer rate. And now we're at U.S. Uh, Thunderbolt 3.0, which is 40 gigs per second. And by the way, that's a true 40 gigs per second. So that's reading and writing. It's bi-directional transfer rate. So it's just astronomical what we're doing with these, with these components. Now, just to go over it, inside of our desktops, we have um, expansion slots. And PCI Express happens to be one of those expansion slots. And as you can see, we can annihilate USB uh, Thunderbolt 3.0 or USB 3.1 with the PCI Express. So consequently, when we're looking at transferring a lot of data, they now make those solid state drives instead of connecting to, to SATA, which is 6 gig per second. We now can connect those 
to a PCI Express slot, which if you notice, makes those solid state drives just hum. I mean, it is amazing to have one of those fire up that desktop. Boom, the operating system's right up and you're ready to work. So there's just some ideas. You're actually gonna do some homework this week. Um, in regards to some of these ports, give me more information, what they're about. So you'll need to do more study to do that. Now the last one to cover is the ethernet port and that's at 100 megabits per second. Now though, Ethernet will handle one gigabit per second, and there's even Ethernet handling multiple gigabits over a better Ethernet cable, a CAT6 cable. So just a little bit more for you to know. Now, protecting hardware, it's important that we protect our phones. We have a lot of data on our phones. And of course, biometrics now is a common way of protecting. Why? Because it is convenient and the price of building biometrics into phones has gone way down. So the, the fingerprint reader on a smartphone, consequently you have to have my fingerprint and my phone in order to access the data that's on it. Now before that we would use pins, uh, we would use uh, swipe patterns, anything to protect that data. And folks, I highly encourage you to protect your data, protect the devices that store your personal information, that's that store your personal communications. Um, you may even have a banking app that you've configured to save your password, for example. So if I gain access to your phone, I'm in your account and I can transfer some money pretty darn quickly. So other ways of protecting, when we talk about hardware and servers, we wanna look at surge protectors. We might look at battery backups. So if it's an imperative system, we might have a battery system that will power the device, especially with servers. We don't want servers to go down as soon as the power pulls. We can lose a ton of valuable data that's being processed right then and there in that moment. So what we do, we create a battery backup system. Most, um, they're called U UPSs, universal power supplies. We plug the devices in there and if the power goes out, uh, the batteries take over and we can get those you know, huge, last for hours. Most of the time, we just need them to last for a few minutes so we have time to restore. Now in data centers, what they're gonna do, they're gonna have massive generators. So if their main power goes out, those generators are gonna instantly kick on while the UPSs provide power and keep that data center going. So surge protectors, of course, very important. So if there's an electrical surge that goes through that power cable, it can destroy a computer um, in an instant, you know, for example, just, just a little static electricity on your finger. If you're not grounded to a computer while you're working on it, just a little static electricity could take out components such as memory or the motherboard. And we definitely don't want that to happen. So here's that UPS that I talked about. And then finally, I'll, I'll just briefly touch on some health concerns. You know, as we're using computers, we want to make sure we can keep these screens low so they're not very bright. We can reduce the light in a room so that we can reduce the brightness of a monitor that we might be staring at eight, 10 hours a day like I do. The idea of ergonomics being in a good position, a healthy position in which to spend time using computers. A lot of you might remember when everyone started using computers, it was all about the carpal tunnel syndrome, you know, where we weren't placed well on a, on a, on a, keyboard and thus our wrists were affected. I think it's funny that a lot of people still don't sit in a good healthy ergonomic position. We're just not seeing as much carpal tunnel as we used to. So I think some of it was just a, a popular infliction. Again, in my humble opinion, okay? We just don't see as much anymore. Technology addiction. You know, we talked about this briefly in class. Yes, you can get addicted to Facebook. You can get addicted to Pinterest or Snapchat. Uh, you can get addicted to gaming. They actually have support centers. They have treatment centers. They have 12-step um, organizations for gaming addiction, just like gambling addiction or drugs and alcohol addictions. So keep in mind as you're using this stuff, are you balancing your technology life with real life, are you getting out or are you sitting in front of the computer? So here you see some optimal things for 
you know, what works well, what are the suggested heights of things. It really is a matter of being comfortable and not having your, your neck be looking way down or looking way up, you know, having good comfort flex in the elbows. Uh, I definitely use a wrist pad, which notice here, notice this bow in this wrist. Okay, I wouldn't necessarily accept this. I might want to pad under the wrist so that my whole arm is a little bit more straight as I use the mouse, for example, or even on a keyboard. So just some things for you to consider if you start experiencing pain while using computers. Look at where the monitor is. Uh, eye strain, look at how much brightness is in the monitor. Look at all those things and just make sure you're safe in using the computer and uh, keeping yourself healthy. So here's the summary of items, and then we're back. That's part three, folks. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I hope you have a great day. Take care.